John has written several historical articles, one published in Wild West Magazine. He and his wife Peggy live in Bozeman. John's inspiration for this book came from a chance encounter with Nelson Story's grandson, Mal Malcolm, in 1976. He began his serious research of Nelson's story in the 1990s, and over the years gathered an impressive array of sources. His quest to learn more took him to the LDS library in Salt Lake City, led to correspondence with people from Story's hometown in Ohio, and a fellow researcher in California. He gathered materials from the Kansas State Historical Society as well. But he told me in an email that the most revealing information came from court records housed with Gallatin County and the Gallatin County Historical Society. So here, here to local archives, I say. <laughs> he has taken all those research materials and crafted a meticulous study of story, and you will find John does not flinch from exposing all sides of the man's complex character. In the weeks since the book's release at the end of June, John has had a chance to do interviews and readings in Bozeman and Sheridan. The book was the number one seller at Country Bookshelf in Bozeman the third week of July. And an excerpt from the book, published as an article in Montana, the magazine of Western history, won the prize for best scholarly article from the Wild West History Association this summer. And I hope John doesn't mind, but I want to share some comments a reader sent to him in an email. Uh-oh. <laughs> the reader wrote, John, your book on Nelson's story was the best I have ever read regarding Western history. Your balanced insight into Nelson's story's complex personality make your book stand out. If I were to recommend one source for newcomers to read on the history of our region in Montana, it would be Treasure State Tycoon. Congratulations on topping off many years of research, writing, and editing with such a wonderful book on a fascinating character. With that high praise, I will turn the floor over to John and what I sh I'm sure will be a terrific presentation. And following his talk today, he will be staying to sign copies of the book out here in the lobby which are available in our museum store. Again, thank you all for coming <clears throat> today, and John. Yeah. Well, thank you, Diana. Am I coming through? No? Make sure I have everything turned on the way it's supposed to be. I think I do. Am I? Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Diana. It's, uh, don't put any pressure on me or anything to try to give a, a decent presentation, but I do want to take this opportunity to, to thank Diana and everybody with uh, the Publications Department of the Montana Historical Society for believing in the book and giving me encouragement, uh, putting up with my uh, sometimes impatience they saw it through, they helped to make it a better product, and I'm very grateful to them for seeing to it that this book uh, on Nelson's story ended up getting published. So I want to thank Diana and everybody, like I say, in publications for that, and also thank you for, for coming here today. When you look at the history of Montana, you see, a, for primarily for the men, you see an array of areas that were primary, that were extremely important in building the state and creating wealth. Obviously, one of the first ones would be the gold mines, okay, when gold was discovered in Bannock, and then Alder Gulch, and then Confederate Gulch, and up here at Last Chance Gulch. That drew a lot of people in, and a lot of people made some pretty good money at it. Also of importance, cattle. Uh, Conrad Coors, very successful cattleman, just to name one. The agricultural possibilities, especially milling, wheat milling. There's real estate, banking, and then kind of some side-offs, some... Uh, side shoots, if you will, that you would call politics as well. Nelson Story was involved in all of those. He came here initially working in the mines, came with his wife Ellen, 
got here in 1863. She was probably the first white woman to live in Alder Gulch. Uh, he rode with the vigilantes. Uh, in 1865, 66, uh, in the wake of the end of the Civil War, Nelson's story came to learn that in Texas, Longhorn cattle had overpopulated the region, basically. Um, the men from Texas were all off serving the stars and bars during what one lady from North Carolina told me was the War of Northern Aggression. And when they were gone, the Longhorn cattle population just took off. 1866, you could get a Longhorn steer from anywhere from five to 10 bucks. You get it up to a Western Fort, it was worth $20. If you could get that steer to Chicago, it was worth $40 a head. That's because all the markets from the South had been closed off during the Civil War, okay? But then once they were open, there was a huge demand for beef. That explains all those cattle drives right after the Civil War, so many that you see movies about. Nelson Story decided to bring a herd of longhorn cattle from Texas, but bring them up to Montana. Um, he also wanted to start a mercantile store. While he and Ellen were living in Alder Gulch, actually Summit, uh, near Virginia City, the community of Bozeman was founded. And he decided that would be a better place to live and to raise a family and also to open a mercantile store. All right, I'm going to see if I can do this. Yes. Whoops, that's, uh, let's see, let's go back. I hit it too fast. So he went down to Fort Worth, Texas with a couple of friends in 1866, and he bought 600 head of Longhorn cattle. You will hear in, well, you will read in some publications, some magazines, it says he had 2,000 head. He had 3,000 head. Those numbers are incorrect. He left Texas with 600. When he got to uh, a camp on the Yellowstone River, he had 1,000. I'll explain why here in just a quick second. So if somebody asks you, was it 600 or 1,000 head? You can give a great political answer. You can just smile and say both. You know? But anyway, he headed up, he hired some drovers, headed up the Texas Road. And at Baxter Springs, Kansas Jayhawkers, Missouri Bushwhackers were stopping all cattle traffic, claiming that Longhorn cattle from Texas was spreading tick fever into Kansas. Well, that disease was a concern, but not to the extent that the Jayhawkers claimed it was. For the most part, it was a scheme to confiscate cattle or to make cattlemen pay a lot of money through the nose to be able to continue on. So it was thievery. Story got there. Well, he wasn't going to pay uh, any money to continue on with his cattle. Um, he decided he would just bypass this blockage here at Baxter Spring, thousands upon thousands of cattle were backed up. He acquired about 400 more head here, fr purchased from other cattlemen, some purchased, some, what do I want to say, uh, purloined, shall we say, helped himself to, and went on over this way to Wichita, staying as best as he could in the Indian Territory. Up here, you had established Kansas counties. As long as he could stay out of those, he wouldn't be bothered. Swung around, headed up through Topeka, and got to Fort Leavenworth. At Fort Leavenworth, he learned that the uh, Army had instituted, had instituted rather General Order Number 27, it said if you wanted to proceed from Fort Leavenworth and if you were headed to the Bozeman Trail, you had to have at least 20 wagons and 30 armed men. Story did buy wagons for his groceries, for his supplies in Fort Leavenworth. When he left Fort Leavenworth with the herd, a horse herd, and all these wagons, having hired some Teamsters and what have you, 
When he left, he was still about five or six short. So we believe that right around Fort Kearney, and this would make sense, Fort Kearney in Nebraska Territory, here uh, he was able to hire more men. It could maybe have been further up the trail, but most likely here because Fort Kearney was one of the more important checkpoints for the Bozeman Trail. He left, moved on up, uh, following basically the Oregon Trail, all the way until he got to Fort Laramie. There, the U.S. Army advised him due to the fights along the Bozeman Trail. Oops. Due to the fights along the Bozeman Trail, he was advised to take a different route, and he said, forget it. Not going to do that. He was very confident because when he was in Fort Leavenworth, he bought enough Remington breech-loading rifles with a rolling block system, the best rifles on the market. He bought enough of those for all of his men. So they were extremely well armed. He proceeded on from Fort Leavenworth to Deer Creek Station and moved up to Fort Reno. At Fort Reno, they were attacked by Indians on a couple of different occasions. Uh, when the uh, Indians were able to attack the camp, uh, one man died, two others were severely wounded, they would recuperate at Fort Reno. Uh, the Indians made off with about 40 head of cattle. Stories got a lot of his men to come with him, trailed the Indians, attacked their camp, killed a good deal of them, and he got those cattle back, except for a few that had been killed and butchered. So he was a very determined, gutsy individual, to say the least. From Fort Reno, pursuing on, uh, these are some of the more well-known battles along the Bozeman Trail, Kirkendall fight, the crazy woman fight. He gets to Fort Phil Kearney, where Colonel Carrington is in command, and Carrington says, you'll have to wait, and this is November, all right? So he wants to keep a good pace. He doesn't want to get caught in the snow. The weather is changing. He's got to move. But the commander, Carrington, tells him, you don't have enough men. Stay here. Story says, what do you mean I don't have enough men? I've got 30 men. He says, well, I'd prefer you have 40. Story, and I think rightly suspected that what Carrington really, really wanted was his cattle to be able to feed to his soldiers. So anyhow, Carrington made him sit and wait, and they waited. Uh, eventually, one of their uh, cowboys was killed by Indians while watching the herd. So after almost two weeks, Story is still refused permission uh, to proceed. He went in one last time to talk to Carrington, and reading from the book, after he talked to Carrington, upon returning to camp, Story assembled the men and explained the situation. It was too dangerous to remain at Fort Phil Kearney, and the winter was coming. Story wanted to get his cattle to the Yellowstone Valley, see his wife and young daughter. They had had their first child, Alice Montana Story. He offered a choice to his drovers. If they could make Fort C.F. Smith about 90-plus miles further up the road, uh, further up the trail, they would be out of the heart of Sioux territory. If they disobeyed, Carrington and the army would confiscate the herd, and Story would be unable to issue any paychecks to his men. So he had lost a couple of men who were wounded or killed, so Story and the 25 men uh, of the 27 total, Story and 25 others agreed to proceed on. The only dissenter among the group was a fellow named George Dow, and Story had him immediately bound, gagged, and tossed into the back of a wagon so as not to tell Carrington or the U.S. Army uh, exactly where he was going. Um, they snuck out at night. How they managed to elude watchers, the soldiers, I don't know. Their camp was a couple of miles south of Fort Phil Kearney. So they did a huge loop, and they managed to pick up the Bozeman Trail once again, stayed on the trail. 
The Indians had already gotten a taste near Fort Reno of their brand new Remington rifles, so for the most part, they went unmolested. Carrington was furious when he found out Story had left, but by that point, what could he do? This, by the way, is the abbreviated version, obviously, of the cattle drive. On to Fort C.F. Smith and headed on up to the cow camp. Uh, this is where he established his cow camp, is right near the mouth of the Shields River where it hits the Yellowstone. Crow land included all this portion of Wyoming up the Yellowstone and then up to the Muscle Shell and then swinging back down this way. Story put his cow camp as close to Crow land as he could without being on Crow land. The reason? When the government wasn't looking, he ran his cattle on Crow land. All that luxurious grass that was located there. Um, he, uh, yeah, with the establishment of the cow camp in early December, the community of Bozeman was starting to take off, um, running cattle then in the Yellowstone Valley. Also, it should be noted, not only was there this crow land, but another huge advantage was the open range of this right here. And he was just about the first cattleman to take advantage of the open range in the Yellowstone Valley. He took advantage of a lot of other things throughout his life, throughout his uh, business career. Eventually, the forts on the Bozeman Trail, the government closed them because of Red Cloud's War. Uh, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho put up a very good fight, and the government finally decided to close the trail because it was so dangerous. Up their sleeve, they had another plan. They were going to eradicate the buffalo. That would take care of the Native Americans. But, no pun intended, that's another story. Okay. <laughs> anyway, these forts are closing. Story is one of the Bozeman businessmen who comes down to Fort C.F. Smith to buy that equipment, that hardware, those goods that the Army was not going to take with them when they left. Um, so he uh, negotiated, uh, find my place here. Well, just to cut to the quick, so to speak, uh, Story uh, was with all the wagons he had, all the wagons that he had brought along up the trail had a huge, huge advantage. He had been selling potatoes and vegetables to the Fort C.F. Smith soldiers, and they needed that because they were fighting off scurvy. But then when they closed it, he came down, he bought things like Dutch ovens for about two, one or two dollars a piece. And it was the same with nails and other farming equipment. Even a sawmill he bought at a rock bottom price. Um, let's see, bought white lead, 10,000 pounds of nails, seven mowing machines. Uh, I already mentioned the, the uh, sawmill. Uh, some of these items for as little as a dollar a piece. What did he do? He took all these items, put them on his wagons, came back west, sold some of them in Bozeman, and then took them on up to Helena, what he didn't sell in Bozeman. He was able to get $100 for the Dutch ovens that he paid $1 or $2 for. So you can see, although it was dangerous in the Yellowstone Valley, you can see that it was worth the effort. Uh, he started then to even further build his wealth uh, by doing, well, look at it this way. The soldiers, when they first saw men like Nelson Story delivering supplies, they would refer to him as a Commodore. Here comes Commodore Story. When they later found out how much he paid for the equipment and the government was letting it go at really, really low prices because they wanted to get the heck out of there. But when they, when they found out how much money Story was making, they quit calling him Commodore and called him that old pirate. And basically that was, that was true. That was a, a very, very fair assessment. The Crow Reservation was established in the Yellowstone Valley 
all that land south of the Yellowstone River. That includes the Paradise Valley. Um, that was part of Crow land starting in 1868. Crow headquarters was set up near present-day Livingston. And here's where a story and Leander Black and a few other Bozeman businessmen were able to take advantage of a government system uh, that from local merchants they would buy flour, beef, pork, other supplies to feed the Indians, okay? And uh, a lot of very serious profit making went on as a result in the Yellowstone Valley. Story was one of those he had with the complicity of the agent, with the complicity of some crooked people in the government. Nelson's story was able to sell the same goods to the Crow Reservation twice. He had little things set up, I mean, which were so farcical. He had to have cooperation from the government. He would come in and sell them 100 horses. They said, well, we wanted 200. And he says, okay, okay, let me get some more. He'd have his men run the horses around the hill again. There, there's the other 100. Of course, he was playing games, and the purchasers for the government weren't that stupid. They got a good laugh out of it as well, and they went ahead and paid uh, that amount for the horses. One point, they paid $10 a head for horses for the Crow people. They decided a couple of years later to sell them. Story bought them for about 2 or $3 a head. And then he turned around and was able to sell them to whites. Some of the goods he was supposed to sell to the Crows went into the reserva uh, reservation warehouse. Um, it would sit there for a while. Story was paid for it. Then he would remove it from the warehouse and take it to Bozeman or Helena and sell it to others. In effect, getting paid twice. That really helped him to, uh, shall we say, pad his IRA account, even though they didn't have an IRA account in those days. Billy Frazier, this is from the book again, Billy Frazier was a son of George and Elmira Frazier, and he worked for Nelson Story uh, part-time. He was asked later if Story was dishonest in his uh, agency dealings. And he says, well, yeah, but any smart guy would have done the same thing. And I'm quoting him, I remember one time I took a load of oats down to the agency for him. It rained while I was on the way. I took the wagon sheet off my load and let it rain. We sold the oats by the weight when we delivered them at the agency. Wet grain weighed heavier than dry. When I left Bozeman, my load weighed 8,000 pounds. When I weighed in at the agency, it weighed 11,000 pounds. Oats sold at three cents a pound, that means $90 difference to me. I showed Story my bill of lading when I got back to Bozeman. He asked me why the oats weighed more in the agency than when they did when I left Bozeman. I told him, and offered to split the 90 bucks with him, he just laughed and told me to keep it. As far as story was concerned, and this was going on all throughout the West, this was one of the things that really rocked the U Ulysses S. Grant administration, um, was the thievery, the dishonest dealings with the American Indians. It was one of the reasons so many Indians left the reservation in 1875. And when the government tried to get them to come back in 1876, we know what happened down along the Little Bighorn River. Custer got sued, S-I-O-U-X-E-D. Anyway, Nelson's story was taken before a grand jury twice because of the reports of his rather underhanded dealings. The first time, they said there wasn't enough evidence to bring formal charges. He later bragged it cost him $10,000 to bribe that jury. The second jury met about a year later, and it was pretty close to the same story. They never did bring any formal charges against him or the agent. Story family, early 1880s. 
Ellen, well, let's go left to right. That's uh, Rose Story, their daughter, and of course, Nelson. I only saw him smile. Well, in the 19th century, people didn't smile when they got their photos taken. I don't know why, but he only smiled once in a photo, and I always thought, well, that, that's probably appropriate. In the back there, whoops. In the back, that's uh, Nelson Jr., who for his life would be known as Bud. There's TB, that's Thomas Byron's story. He would be known as Bine. Walter's story, the youngest, and this is Ellen's story. Ellen had three other children. They had three other daughters. All of them died in childhood, which unfortunately those days, you know, childhood mortality was a lot higher than it was today. By this time, the 1880s story had kind of segued out of the reservation business. He had now helped take over a bank in Bozeman. He had real estate holdings in a lot of different areas in and around the town. With those rentals, his income just kept increasing and increasing and increasing. In 1886, 1887, he built what would be called one of the finest mansions that lies between the Twin Cities and Seattle. And it was very elegant. In fairness, you got to remember, in the mid-1880s, there wasn't a heck of a lot between the Twin Cities and Seattle. All right? But nonetheless, uh, the Avant Courier, the newspaper there, rightfully called the $120,000 Second Empire-style structure a palace. Residents featured three stories and a full basement. The first floor ceiling stood 14 feet high, those of the second story 13 feet, and a mansard roof capped the third floor at 16 feet. Bricks for the 20-inch thick exterior walls were dipped in stale beer to seal their color. I don't know what it is about stale beer that seals the color of a brick. It, it, did make me worry for a while about the stuff I drank when I was in college, you know? <laughs> oh my God. But I'm still breathing, so I guess it all turned out okay. It's amazing there would be any stale beer around. That's very true. That's very true. He didn't drink much. Every now and then he would. But for the most part, he didn't drink. He didn't gamble. Uh, he already had his biggest vice was his short temper, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, of those who, people, family, which, where did Malcolm come in? Malcolm would have been one of the sons of Byron, T. Byron. He was a grandson of Nelson, one of the sons of Thomas Byron. Malcolm would have been born, I think it was about 1902. And this was the mid-1880s. Um, Anyhow, all that wealth he had accumulated, as I was saying, allowed him to build this rather extravagant mansion. Uh, beltings, projections, entablatures, shafts, copings were made of either Casoto sandstone or polished red granite brought in from Sioux Falls. Stone balcony covered the outer vestibule, quite the place, torn down in the mid-1930s. We'll talk about that also here in uh, in just this was located in Bozeman um, Wilson School where the Wilson School is it was on the far west side of the Wilson School right across from where Bamboo Garden is on Main Street if it was still standing that's where uh, that's where it would be um, another look at Ellen Story, as I alluded to, had something of a short fuse, had an awful temper. Uh, he could be verbally abusive uh, to business rivals and to family members. Unfortunately, he could also be physically abusive. And unfortunately, his wife Ellen felt that physical abuse. He did hit her once in the head, giving her a very slight scar above her eyebrow that she carried with her for the balance of her life. Uh, milling operation, 
story, as I mentioned earlier, did, oh, before I get there, this is Rose, his daughter, the only daughter that survived uh, to adulthood. Uh, as you can tell, Rose didn't have a lot of suitors. Uh, she ended up marrying a doctor from New York who was about 10 years older than she was. And this is a guy that Nelson Story would come to despise. His name was Garrett Hogan. As it turned out, I mean, Story, his daughter and her husband kind of bled him dry. Well, not dry. He had too much money. But he paid for their honeymoon, bought him a house in Bozeman, set his son-in-law up with a pharmacy, bought the pharmacy in Bozeman, all the medicine, so forth and so on. Uh, Garrett Hogan turned out to be a bad businessman. Nelson Story would, on several occasions, continuously bail him out. Anyway, uh, the mill, the ups and downs of uh, the flour milling industry. Uh, we'll get back to Bud and Bine here in a minute. The ups and downs of the flour milling industry. What was kind of interesting, something of a sidebar about Montana history, is the fact that there was a time period when people in Montana were buying flour that was imported from Minnesota. With all these flouring mills, and the Gallatin Valley came to be known as the Minneapolis of Montana. Clearly, Minneapolis had that great reputation for all of its mills. The Gallatin Valley garnered it for, uh, for Montana. And... They started a campaign, all these milling company owners started a campaign to try to get Montanans to buy Montana-made uh, flour. Uh, one of those who assisted in this effort was Helena National Bank President Erastus Edgerton. He and others accused Montana dealers of prejudicing local taste by selling one-third rate flour from western Montana. Edgerton claimed the Gallatin Valley was burdened down with the weight of its generous crop, and Montana's preoccupation with silver had caused her citizens to forget about other resources such as wheat. And he went on to cite the Nelson Story Mill that people were just not buying enough from. Nelson Story Mill has a capacity of 300 barrels a day. The Bozeman Milling Company has a capacity of 200 barrels a day making a total of 500 barrels a day, first class in every particular, costing thousands of dollars to build, equal to any mill of the same size in Minneapolis. This campaign eventually worked. People started buying Montana-made flour. For some reason, they thought the flour from the Midwest shipped via Minneapolis was better flour <laughs> than what was being grown uh, right in their backyards. Uh, actually, it was about the same. So the, the flower people in Minneapolis were doing a pretty good job. With all the volume, they were undercutting or coming as close to it as they can while still maintaining some kind, some kind of a profit. Through the 1880s, into the 1890s, the Story family ran the Story flour mill. In the early 1890s, Nelson Story sold his cattle herd, which by then had grown to about 13 to 14,000 head. The open range era in the Yellowstone Valley was coming to an end, and Story had other plans. In the 1880s, the Story family was one of the first Montana families uh, to become snowbirds. During the winter, they maintained a very nice mansion in Los Angeles, uh, in the Adams District, a pretty nice part of Los Angeles in those days. It's very close to the Southern California campus. Today, it's kind of close to a rather rough neighborhood, but back then it was for the Hui Palui, yes. Is that right? We were down there, oh gosh, it's been 20 years. Yeah. This is just two to two and a half years ago, all that started. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. Uh, we went by where the mansion, his mansion would have been, and it wasn't there anymore. So, 
But anyway, kind of bummed about that. I was going to ask for our money back, but who am I going to try and get our money back from? That's another story. So anyway, Nelson's story has this winter home, palatial winter home down in Southern California. Uh, and he starts investing in Los Angeles real estate. Real estate along Broadway, real estate along Spring Street, not too far from what became the Miracle Mile in Los Angeles. One piece of land he purchased, gave to his son, youngest son, Walter. It was eventually, um, Walter eventually built one of Los Angeles' first skyscrapers. It's located at the corner of 5th and Broadway. And it's still used, and it's still called the Walter P. Story Building, right in downtown Los Angeles. But there are other properties there. He purchased in the 1890s, gave to his kids. They sold later, and for the most part, they really, really reaped some great profits. In particular, Walter. Walter, when he died in the 1950s, he had an estate of like 10 or $11 million. Okay. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> eventually Nelson Story turned over the milling operation to his two sons. On the left, again, that's Bine, and on the right is Bud, Nelson Jr. Here they are in later years. This would have been right around 1920. Nelson Story decided he was going to retire. He had dabbled a little bit in politics, 1894, uh, 96 rather. He was a candidate for U.S. Senator from Montana. That was back in the days when the Senate, the state Senate, chose the senator for Washington, D.C. Uh, obviously, he wasn't chosen. One of the reasons was his reputation that hung around, left over from his days dealing with the agency. One newspaper said something to the effect, we don't need a senator in Washington with a lot of dollar signs in front of his name. Something along those lines. Um, he was also a silver Republican, kind of alluded to that, and helped to oversee a visit to Bozeman by William Jennings Bryan. Became something of a, kind of a friend of William Jennings Bryan. But he retired eventually, going into the teens, 1900. But before he retired, uh, still managed to get on the bad side of some rivals in business. Most business people got along with him well, even during the days of the Crow Reservation, because as long as that money trickled into Bozeman and filtered on down and everybody got a piece of the pie, as long as the Indians remained peaceful, they looked the other way. One time, Nelson Story told his two sons, Bud and Bine, go out to our north side ranch. There's a mule out there. I want you to get that mule and bring him back here. But don't rope him. Just escort him back. They go out. They get the mule. They're coming back. Bud couldn't resist trying to lasso the animal. And he did. Then the mule <laughs> broke away and trotted on into the family yard with the rope around it. And there's Nelson. I thought, I told you boys not to rope that mule. Bud started to explain. Nelson says, shut up. And the next damn one of you that says anything, I'm going to knock him off his horse. Bine couldn't resist saying, well, we can rope that mule just as well as you can. And before he finished his sentence, Nelson picked up a brick, hurled it at him. Bud ducked, or the thing would have hit him in the head, jumped off his horse, ran for downtown Bozeman with Nelson in close pursuit. Nelson was older, he couldn't run too much, and Bine got away and waited downtown until Nelson had cooled off. That was just another example of uh, uh, his temper. He, in the 1890s, foreclosed property owned by Bozeman businessman Joe Lindley. The property happened to be a series of, shall we say, hotels for single girls, located joy houses located downtown. That kind of kicked off a feud between Joe Lindley and Nelson Story. Uh, Joe Lindley wrote a lot of nasty letters to Nelson Story, and then Story, uh, having to wanting to divert water to his mill, 
went and he had the water rights, went on Joe's property and cut down cottonwood trees to build a dam to deflect water into the mill ditch that went to his flour mill operation. So that also got on Joe Lindley's nerves. So they had a few run-ins. On one instance, they had an argument in downtown Bozeman. Joe Lindley, always angry over the fact Story had foreclosed on him, and Story ended up whacking Joe right between the eyes with the butt of his Navy Colt revolver. Uh, it was a Navy Colt revolver. Um, I don't know how I managed to hit that, but we're almost done, so that's okay. Um, but after that particular incident, he always referred to that Navy Colt as his Lindleyizer because of what he did to Joe. He chased Joe one another time across the street through Phillips Bookstore after they had an argument. Lindley got away. They were constantly arguing and fighting, Nelson getting the better end of it all the time. The newspaper there called it the vexatious misunderstanding. Uh, Joe Lindley tried to sue him. Nelson Story always claimed self-defense. He always had a lot of good luck with juries in Bozeman because they always sided with him that it was self-defense. The stories, as a matter of fact, had Joe, this kid went on and on and on, they had Joe tried for his sanity. And a panel of doctors, I think by one or two votes, ruled that, yeah, Joe's kind of on edge, but he's not deranged or crazy enough to be put in the state sanitarium uh, up at uh, Warm Springs. But story did try uh, to have him committed. Um, accumulated all that money accumulated all of that uh, <laughs> uh, reputation, some of it good, some of it bad, uh, the bad seeming to outweigh the good. It's one of the reasons there has not really been a serious biography attempted on Nelson's story before. His family didn't want to talk about him, basically, despite all the things that he had accomplished. He was a Montana capitalist. He was one of those who profited quite well from all the different endeavors that Montana had to offer that I outlined at the beginning. Everything from gold mining to cattle to real estate, you name it. Uh, he was to Montana what Leland Stanford was to California or John Creighton was to Nebraska. Both those guys got universities named after him. Nelson didn't. But he played a huge role in helping Bozeman to get uh, Montana State University. As you'll recall, they had a runoff back in the early 1890s when Montana became a state to see where the people wanted to put the state capital. Well, it was already here from the territorial days, so everybody thought that it would just stay here. Well, Bozeman put its hat in the ring to try and become the state capital. Promotional campaign noted that it has to be Bozeman because it has the cleanest water, the cleanest air, uh, the freshest water, the healthiest babies, and the prettiest girls. So, as we all know, though, <laughs> it stayed here in Helena, which only made sense. As a consolation prize, Bozeman did get the State Agriculture College, as I said, which today is Montana State University and probably got the better end uh, of the deal in so doing. Did he ever get help with the Grand Tours policy? Not really, no. No. Yeah, I mean, he rubbed elbows every now and then with, with people like Coors or Thomas Power or Samuel Hauser, what have you. Yeah, well, yeah, Coors, I, well, Coors ran a lot of cattle in the Yellowstone Valley. By the 1880s, there were a lot of cattlemen uh, running their cattle there. And sometimes when it was roundup time, they would pool all their workers together to help sort out and weed out the cattle. But for the most part, he didn't have too many, uh, you know, 
uh, business dealings with uh, Grant Coors. This was also the time when they really put a, more pressure on the reservation, more pressure on the reservation to, uh, to um, use the land, the Crow land, uh, which they were prohibited from doing. And eventually, portions of the Crow land was opened up uh, to grazing. Uh, kind of running out of time here. Want to leave time for some questions. That's kind of a, uh, it certainly is not the James Mechner view of Nelson Story's life. Really don't have time for that. Um, there's Malcolm. Met him in the mid-1970s. He was quite the character. He released a lot of information about his grandfather, and that really, really helped to put all the pieces together for the biography, along with some other places uh, in Bozeman. I should mention Ellen died in 1924. Nelson died in 1926. He actually died down in Los Angeles. Uh, he had retired, as I mentioned. He was living in Bozeman. Okay, there we go. I accidentally figured out a way to fix it. <laughs> Either that Diana, all your computers are about to crash. I don't know which one it is. Um, but, uh, yeah, Malcolm is one of those who released a lot of information, some family letters that really turned out to be instrumental in, in helping to put the biography of him together. Uh, Nelson's story should not be adored, but he does deserve to be acknowledged. He was... Very important in the young history of Bozeman. In the mid-1980s, reflect back now on the run-ins he had with Joe Lindley. Uh, they put up a statue of Nelson's story in the mid-1980s in Bozeman. Uh, him on his horse, as he would have looked during the Texas cattle drive. Guess where they put it? Lindley Park. <laughs> the Lindley family had donated a lot of the land there, which is now... Lindley Park, so poor Joe's still doing this in his grave. Um, <clears throat> one thing a lot of people will ask, and this gets back to the cattle drive, Larry McMurtry said that, yes, indeed, Lonesome Dove was loosely based on the story cattle drive. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I would put an emphasis on the word loosely. The only thing Lonesome Dove had in common with the story Cattle Drive is the fact it started in Texas and ended up in Montana. All right? Lonesome Dove is more about uh, a cattle drive that was done by the partners Goodnight and Loving. I think it was 1867 when they took a herd of cattle from El Paso, Texas over to Fort Sumner, New Mexico. But, again... It is loosely based, okay, so I'm not totally dismissing it altogether. There is a book that was made into a motion picture in the mid-1950s that is based right on the story Cattle Drive. Once Hollywood got their hands on it, of course, they kind of took a lot of literary license with it. It's called The Tall Men, and the motion picture starred Clark Gable, Montgomery Clift, Robert Ryan. Robert Ryan played the guy who made a lot of money mining up in Montana uh, in a community called Mineral City, which is obviously renamed Virginia City. His character, Robert Ryan, his character's name was Nathan Stark. Same initials as Nelson's story. Same number of letters, and it's not a coincidence. So, Lonesome Dove is a better production. <laughs> it is. Uh, for the motion picture, they tossed in Jane Russell. <laughs> you know, they, uh, you know, box office value. You got Clark Gable and Jane Russell. Holy cow, you know, who, who wants to pass that up? Anyway, I could go on and on and on further. But I do want to reserve some time here. We can just kind of kick things around. There might be some aspect of his life I didn't cover you might be curious in. Or you could have questions on something I said. As Diana did say, uh, the book is in uh, the bookstore. 
They've got it on a table out in the lobby, available for your shopping pleasure, if you like, at the end of this talk. And if you do decide to buy a copy, I'll be happy to sign it for you if you'd like. So, are there any questions? Okay, yeah, you bet. You bet. If there's any questions or... Oh, thank you. Yes, I, I meant to talk about that. The Story Mansion uh, that was completed in 1887, located on Main Street. A lady asked about what happened to the Story Mansion. Um, after, uh, in the 1930s, after the death of Nelson and Ellen, uh, Bud, Nelson Jr., died rather prematurely. He was 58 years old, died of a stroke. Uh, Rose and her husband were spending, well, they became permanent residents of Los Angeles. Thomas Byron's story, who built the current, what they call the Story Mansion today on South Wilson. It's really not the Story Mansion, but it's America. You can call it what you want, I guess. Yeah, he did for 10 years. Uh, Thomas Byron's story did, he and his family, until he lost his shirt. When the wool market crashed, he was heavily invested in sheep and the land to go with that. So anyway, the market crashed after World War I. He lost his shirt. He had to sell it uh, to the SAEs. And he and his wife and family moved into the original Story Mansion. And they stayed there for a while. And during the Depression, uh, Bine and his wife Kate decided to sell the mansion to the school district. The school wanted to expand the school that it already had on that block. They did. The Work Progress Administration under Roosevelt was going to come out and expand this basically for free. It was going to be a, a federal project. And so the sentiment at the time was, uh, the stories are selling this to the school district, and the school district's going to pay off all the taxes on it. The sentiment at the time, it being the Depression, was, okay, go ahead. A lot of people lament the fact the, the mansion was not preserved. But given the time frame, the fact Bud was gone, Walter and Rose were living in Southern California, Bine and Kate were in no financial position to preserve it, and there was no interest in the community to preserve it. They tore it down. What year did you say? Uh, 19, I want to say 1936, 36, 37. It was in there somewhere. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Which will be on sale in the... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it was uh, 36, 37. Uh, uh, she asked if he got involved in bank. Yeah, Nelson's story. I, I did kind of gloss over it. But yeah, he got involved in banking. It was an interesting situation since you bring that up. Uh, after the panic of 1893, Story's bank was one of those that remained open. A lot of banks were closing. He met with his board of directors before going to Los Angeles for the winter, and he said, look... We've got a lot of bonds in this bank. If anybody wants to buy them, I want first crack at them. Don't sell them. See you in the spring. Well, while he was gone, they sold them. The reason being, well, if Nelson's story gets them, he's just going to transfer money from one account to the other, and we don't realize a net gain. And we can make money and keep this bank open. Nelson's story gets home, finds out about it, just hits the roof calls the board together and closes the bank. He makes sure to it that all depositors got their money back. One of the board members was a doctor, Dr. Foster, man who performed the first cesarean section west of the Mississippi River, by the way. Um, what the name of the bank? Do you know what the name of the bank was? Uh, Gallatin Valley. Yeah. So anyway... Dr. Foster is overheard saying, and, you know, he was just talking, you know, with hyperbole, somebody ought to take that Nelson story out and hang him. Well, the word got back to Nelson's story. 
So Nelson confronts Dr. Foster on the street and proceeds to beat him with his walking cane. Foster threatens a lawsuit. Story gives him $20,000 to drop charges of assault and to drop the lawsuit. Foster agrees. He takes that money and establishes Bozeman's first hospital. That's how we, Bozeman got its first hospital, indirectly because of Nelson Story's infamous temper. Uh, well, Foster did, yeah, yeah. So there was, yeah, there was, yeah. It, it it was it pretty much was. You know, there was one time, um, the city because his dam was causing flooding on the east side. City workers went out to dismantle it. He came out, caught him, and whacked one of these guys on the back. So they charged him with assault. And in court he said, look, I wasn't trying to assault the guy, I was just trying to get his attention <laughs> to tell him that what he was doing might be dangerous. The jury agreed with him. <laughs> Let him go. He, <laughs> uh, yeah, we know he, <laughs> he used his money in that, that first grand jury hearing, but he sure did have a lot of luck with the courts and the law. That's it? Okay. And um, I'm sure he'd be glad to chat with all of you more out in the lobby. And so he, you can get him situated out there. And don't worry about that. We'll, we'll shut it down for you. These th it always gets me. 10, 11-year-old kids know how to run these things. I can't, I can't figure it out. <laughs>